5 Most Legendary Swords That Actually Exist Throughout history, legendary swords are seared into the collective conscience as fearsome instruments in warfare designed, obviously, for killing enemies, a show of gallantry, and for displaying some sick swordsmith skills. From a gigantic samurai sword that defies human handling to a remarkable sword inflicting wounds that supposedly require brains from a demon making for some unusual healing properties. Here are the 5 most legendary swords that actually exist. Before we begin, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell for more amazing videos every day. With that being said, let's begin. Huh? Hmm. Number 5. Norimitsu Odachi This beast of a sword has a rich history in the ancient feudal system of hand-to-hand -hand combat known as the Samurai. These fierce warriors stretch back for centuries, donning elaborate and intimidating armor, but it is their weapon of choice, namely the sword, that makes them a force to be reckoned with. The Odachi, translated in kanji as large or great sword or nodachi, aka field sword, featuring graded measurements around 12 foot 3 inches in length, a combined weight of 31.97 pounds and a curvature of the blade between 35.43 and 39.37 inches. Try scaling those dimensions next to this guy. Given the massive size of this legendary sword, it would have taken some considerable brawn and height to wield this weapon of choice, leaving many to speculate with theories of giants. Fee, fi, fo, fum. Okay, wrong legend. Besides, this one is actually true. In feudal Japan, the samurai followed the Bushido or the way of the warrior that originated during the Heian period when wealthy landowners seceded from the central government, sick and tired of tyranny is my guess, to forge a league of warriors to protect their turf. Minamoto Yoritomo was one of the landowners to establish the Shogun, a powerful military army that carved out a wave of samurai warriors for 700 years, running since 1192. Although intense engagements were common between the 15th and 16th centuries in Japan, the use of the Odachi as a viable weapon in battle remains debatable. Many people suggest due to its bulky size, it would appear impossible to draw traditionally from the side unless aided by a retainer to pull it out or being carried by horseback. Therefore, it seems more likely a warrior on foot would have slung it across his back for a much easier trick. But opinions vary. During the Edo period in the late 1500s, the samurai ascended to the top of the social caste system, marking the country's history from warring factions over territory before dissolving into a civilized nation, abolishing the samurai class in 1868. Around this time, the Odachi was heralded as a standard, kind of like a flag today, though personally, I think this was just an excuse for the samurai turning soft and the obvious fact, nobody can wield the damn thing. What do you think? Number 4. Sword of Gujian This legendary sword leads the charge in withstanding the test of time, having been preserved in an airtight wooden box next to a skeleton under some hot and humid conditions for over two millennia, leaving it inexplicably rust-free. During a dig in the Hebei province around the ancient ruins of Jinan, the capital of the Chu state, a team of archaeologists salvaging artifacts from a tomb happened upon the sword of Gujian much to their amazement to find it was untarnished. After testing was performed, the composition of the steel blade itself is primarily tempered in copper, giving it resiliency from shattering while the edges contain tin, adding tensile strength to enhance the sharpness factor. Trace elements of other distinctive alloys including iron, lead, sulfur and another little known compound called sulfide cuprum lend this legendary sword its rust-proof quality. The handle features blue and turquoise inlays, a silk-bound grip, 11 concentric circles on the pummel with the sword measuring 21.9 inches in length, finishing out with a width of 1.8 inches. Where it may lack for a menacing sword in terms of size, one can't deny that its ability to stay in mint condition all these years later is a wonder in itself. In Chinese folklore, the Gujian has earned the nickname the gentleman of weapons, stacking up nicely beside three other weapons that include the staff, spear and saber, forming a deadly cocktail in destruction. Go figure that this remarkable piece of weaponry holds both 
historical significance and mythological influence to the cultural heritage of ancient China. With cryptic engravings etched into two columns on one side of the blade, archaeologists were mystified over the official legacy or ownership to justify its royal namesake having only six of the eight characters deciphered. And considering that you have an inscription that reads, King of Yu made this sword for his personal use, provides a vague idea as to who he is when the tallied number of kings to rule the state of Yu was nine. Eventually, archaeologists settled on the famous Emperor Gu Jian, whose reign was during the spring and autumn period, around 771 to 476 BC, apparently an epoch in history where metallurgical technology exploded. Whether this legendary sword got its titular name from a despotic ruler of Yu or was just a lucky draw of the hat is something you, as in Y-O-U, can make an educated guess on. Number three, seven-branched sword. The Nanatsu Saya, no Tachi, has a distinctive appearance noted by three pairs of branch-like protrusions from either side of the blade, along with its sharpened tip, rightfully given its name, the seven-branched sword. This legendary sword is composed of iron spanning two feet and five inches in length, and given its odd construction, many experts suggest that it functioned as a ceremonial piece as opposed to a weapon in combat. The seven branch sword has reportedly been the object of political clout between ancient Japan and the Korean kingdom, known as the Pekche. Japanese and Korean scholars have pitted themselves in endless debate over the historical primacy that makes the seven branch sword stand out as a majestic relic. In other words, both Japan and the Pekche regard the legendary sword as a testament to their independent sovereignty over the other, not to mention laying claim to some mad swordsmith skills. It is believed that the original seven branch sword was rediscovered back in 1945 and has remained in the Aisanokami Shrine located in the Tenrishi in Nara Prefecture in Japan. Given the fact that this shrine has housed a myriad of treasures since antiquity, including the sword itself, it would seem to have its rightful home in the land of the rising sun. However, the sword features telling inscriptions engraved on both sides that may upturn that theory on its head. On one side, an inscription bears praise to the outstanding composition of the sword, which reads, manufactured with a hundred times wrought iron and some magical powers to deflect enemies, quote unquote, the manufacturer. On the reverse side, a second inscription, which is way too long for me to read, can be summed up as, one crown prince of Pekche's king forging a sword for the king of Wa, an old name for Japan, to be passed down for generations to come. While it seems like a noble gesture on the surface, it might come off as a backhanded tactic to give the Pekche kingdom supremacy in crafting swords. However, one interpretation suggests that the inscription once represented the mutual respect between the Yamato rulers and Pekche kings, a clear demonstration of the balance of power between an aristocratic hierarchy in the old world. Nonetheless, the seven branch sword looks more like the casted motif for a cactus than a barbaric instrument fit for a sword fight. What are your thoughts? Number two, Shamashiri Zomorodnaga. The Shamashiri Zomorodnaga, also called King Solomon's sword, is a legendary sword allegedly owned by the biblical figure of the same name. This gold encrusted emerald studded sword is rooted in Persian literature serving as the focal point in the epic of Amir Arsalan. The tale follows the exploits of Fulad Zareh, who is an Ifrit or a powerful horned demon with an insatiable lust for both power and women acting as a head general to the king of the Peri. Did I also mention the demon has a witch for a mother? Following the death of the king, Fulad proceeds to usurp the throne to claim his love for the queen, turning the rightful heir and the castle's court into stone. The mother witch then grants her demonic son immortality against all weapons except the Zomoradnaga, for some unknown reason. Is it me or does this sound like a nursery rhyme straight out of hell? In ancient Persia, a Shamashir dates back to the 12th century, having been introduced to Iran by the Turkic Seljuk Khanate, replacing its predecessor which tended to be straight and double-edged. The traditional Shamshir, like the Zomoradnaga, is characterized by a prominent curving blade noted for its slashing technique, while on horseback, with a narrow tip for ineffective thrust in action. According to the legend, Fulard prized this wicked sword that doubled as a charm against magic and its ability to inflict wounds that were only treatable by a concoction of brains, specifically Fulard's himself. 
It's no small wonder he wanted to keep the Shamashur Booga Booga away from his enemies, even though he and his mother were vanquished in the end by Arsalan. Number 1. Kusanagi no Surugi While everyone is familiar with a katana, the Kusanagi no Surugi comes in at number 1 as a distant cousin with a more ferocious edge to fit the bill on our list. Initially called the Ami no Murakumo no Surugi, translated as Sword of the Gathering Clouds of Heaven, it was later condensed to Kusanagi no Surugi, translating to Grass Cutting Sword, which is known in some circles simply as Kusanagi. I definitely feel it's easier to say in just one word. Hmm. Along with a jewel and a mirror, this legendary sword is included with the Imperial Regalia of Japan, with each representing a set of three virtues, benevolence, wisdom, and, spoiler alert, valor. The origin of the Kusanagi stems from an ancient battle involving Suzanu, the Shinto god of sea and storms, and a mythical beast called Yamato no Oruchi, an eight-headed serpent of Koshi that terrorized a wealthy Izumu family. Why couldn't they give this monster a more pet-friendly name like Yoshi? Hell man, it even rhymes with Koshi! Anyway, the Orichi was anything but gentle though, proceeding to devour the eight daughters one at a time, bringing despair to the family to which Suzanu enters the picture. The Shinto god devises a plan to get the monster drunk by strategically placing eight wooden fence enclosures with vats of sake behind the gates. Depending on the version you read, Suzanu crafted this ingenious trap on graciously receiving or in exchange for the hand and marriage of the last daughter, Kushinada Himi, as a condition of putting an end to the Orichi's reign of terror. Whether this is an early example of an arranged marriage that turned sour is debatable. Ultimately, Suzanu cuts off the eight heads, ending with the tail from where the Kusanagi sword emerges. Later on, Suzanu gives the Kusanagi to his sister, the goddess Amaratsu as a peace offering to end their sibling rivalry. Since then, different accounts of who this legendary sword has fallen into the hands of, its whereabouts and its purported existence remains controversial, which is also why it's last on our list. However, some suggest it is housed in the Atsuta Shrine located in the Nagoya, but knowledge of this evidence is conveniently kept under lock and key. Given the fact that the Kusanagi was last used for the ceremonial coronation of the Japanese Emperor in 1989, not too distant recent past for many of us, along with reports of curses linked to the sword, maybe it's best left uncovered for now. Do you believe that giants left behind their enormous swords as mere artifacts for us to find? Or that a recipe from demon brains can be used as a first aid kit to treat a sword wound? Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.